Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for joining. This is a special podcast uh, video interview series called Solutionary Perspectives. Uh, we are having conversations with allies and potential coalition uh, members of the Solutionary Rail. Our special guest this week is Patrick Cox, PhD, a sustainability advocate who led the Paternales Electric Cooperative in Central Texas the largest and now one of the most innovative electric cooperatives. Dr. Cox served as board director and president during his seven year term to bring democratic reforms to the PEC, which is Paternalis Electric Cooperative Governance and Services. Dr. Cox is also a founding director and former president of the Cooperative Leadership Network or CLN, which is a national education network for electric co-op directors dedicated to clean energy solutions combined with democratic and ethical governance. Dr. Cox is also a nationally recognized and award-winning historian who is active in his community on natural resource protection and advocacy for community-based and collaborative solutions to our problems. All right. Well, uh, Patrick, thank you very much for joining the call. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. I want to speak a little bit about your experience uh, with electrical cooperatives and uh, specifically the one that you have uh, served for and uh, give us a little, maybe a little bit of history, maybe start even with a little bit of history as a historian yourself. Love to do that and thanks Bill and Diane and appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to come on. You contacted me fairly early on about the Solutionary Rail project because of where it's located and involving a, a number of different electric cooperatives throughout the, uh, the north and northwest. So I'm familiar with the project and greatly admire what you are doing and your organization's doing as a, a realistic alternative, by the way, for uh, transportation and the uh, many other things that will emanate from this uh, very worthwhile project. So a um, couple minutes about me and what I did because uh, the first question that comes to mind, why in the world is an historian? And um, I've been involved with uh, Pernell's Electric Co-op as an activist too, but why in the world would somebody like me be interested in involved with uh, an electric co-op? And just very briefly, uh, I started out uh, going back to the, the early 1970s which, as y'all know, was actually the last century. Early on, when I was fairly young, is there were a number of people here, and we live in Central Texas, uh, and the PEC service areas, essentially, everybody knows where Austin, San Antonio are. We're essentially the area that's uh, what is rural, now very much suburban to a large degree too, of Central Texas outside of Austin and San Antonio to the West. We began, a number of us began looking at PEC years ago, interested in not renewable energy at that time, but just interested in uh, helping move the cooperative back into the foundations and the principles of which the co-op was supposed to be uh, governing itself. So this essentially began as a governance issue. And I mentioned that because I think the governance and the clean energy renewable issues really have to go hand in hand. Uh, PEC historically uh, is very interesting. One, it's the largest electric co-op in the country, both by membership, by value, uh, by area served, and just very quickly, it's now over 275,000 members. And when I was on the board, it, this is a billion dollar corporation. We had a total assets of 1.3 billion and over $550 million in annual revenue. It's a, it's a big corporation, especially by co-op standards. Uh, for many years, the PEC, like a lot of other co-ops around the country, was essentially run as you know a closed institution. It was very tightly controlled by a number of families and people that had been involved for uh, for many years. Um, 
And as time evolved uh, through the coming decades and now after 2000, the actually the same people stayed in charge of the electric cooperative. That's not to say that it's necessarily bad, but this particular group, I think, uh, took advantage of their position. They, uh, there was a lot of uh, unsavory, I think would be the polite way of putting it. Uh, it resulted in a, a number of investigations, a lot of media scrutiny, uh, ended up with uh, embarrassment and resignations of board members, uh, including a number of people who were actually friends of mine, but had been on the board for many years and the indictment and conviction of the general manager and the general counsel of the PEC. As a result of that, a, a judge from a class action lawsuit that was filed, ruled on in 2007, there were actually new elections held. And I ran back in uh, 2008 as a, as a known reform member who promised a lot of governance primarily at the time, reforms and governance and what is today called transparency, of course, in financial responsibility. Uh, as it turned out, somehow there were 20 people running and surprise, surprise, I got elected, which was astounding, not just to me and my family, but most everybody else. Um, so I served as a director and then as board president uh, until I retired from the board in 2015. What we did just very briefly on this is it was our goal really to do two things, to make Hardnell's Electric Co-op, to bring it back to its foundation, to its roots and the core values of a co-op. And that is that it was democratically controlled, that it was open and fair, and that we were going to you know, treat our members uh, with respect, exhibit financial accountability, and uh, deal with the amazing growth that was going on here in Central Texas. Uh, by all accounts and by all measurements, and these are independent measurements both from the media, uh, from elected officials, uh, from independent auditors, uh, who have he had to come in and help us reestablish our financial base, our creditors. Uh, we over, it took, didn't happen automatically in the first year, but over the course of uh, about five years, we managed to reestablish and reform the cooperative to really make it a true model in uh, governance and, and operations. A couple of quick examples on that. We put together what uh, was among the first co-ops in the country. We did a member bill of rights, which guaranteed openness and fairness, and uh, especially when it called to uh, for elections, it's democratically controlled elections. Uh, we, res we restored the financial integrity of the cooperative. We uh, improved the financial standing. We returned capital credits, which is an important issue as far as co-ops and their members are concerned. Uh, we improved our credit ratings, our bond ratings. All of this helped the bottom line, believe me. And then, also importantly, we began diversifying our power supply because one of the first things we did when we came in on the power supply side was pass uh, a resolution and this was back in 08 and 09, that we would achieve uh, a both through renewable energy and through energy efficiency, that we would move the Pardonhouse Electric Co-op to obtain by 2020 at least a 20 to 25 percent threshold. Uh, interestingly enough, through a combination of a lot of different policies and programs, and of course the market changed too. Uh, both for solar, wind, and for natural gas, you know, we were able to surpass that way that while I was still on the board, and we now I think have one of the uh, most PEC that is has one of the best uh, uh, solar energy programs. 
We have one of the most diverse and responsible energy portfolios. And we, uh, we are working very closely and we listen to the members, which includes residential, uh, rural, uh, agricultural members, as well as uh, mem- Fortune 500 companies that are in our service area now. So um, I'm real proud, pleased with uh, what PEC and a lot of co-ops and a lot of directors around the country are trying to do. Uh, I think there are a lot of people that are looking for uh, better ways to not just conduct their business and govern their electric co-ops, but they are truly interested in looking for innovative solutions, pardon me, innovative solutions. They want to respond to the marketplace. They understand that uh, renewable energy and efficiency now is a major uh, part of what our energy portfolio should be. And they are open to uh, to innovation and uh, looking for input from groups like this. All right. Well, thank you, Patrick. And I want to make sure that folks get a sense of how much Perfect. of the country, country is served by rural electrical cooperatives. So this is a map, I hope that everybody's seen this, but this is a map of the Rural Electrical Cooperative Network. It was in the invitation to this call. And um, as you can tell, the colored areas are all rural electrical co-ops. Could you speak for a minute about some of the history of rural electrical cooperatives and how they started and when? Right. The the co-ops are the product of the, uh, the 1930s and initiative by the Roosevelt administration and a lot of other people in rural America to establish these primarily distribution but also generation cooperatives and relying on the federal government to provide low interest loans and support in order for people to democratically organize and establish, obtain credit and then uh, build uh, transmission service, plants, you know, generation, and distribute it into rural America. I told you all back when I was here back in the 70s, I had the opportunity to interview and talk to a lot of people who actually worked and lived uh, within the, the, it's called the Texas Hill Country, if you're not familiar with it. It's where, it's, this is Lyndon Johnson, speaking of history, this is Lyndon Johnson's cooperative. The PEC came into existence uh, primarily because Lyndon Johnson and a number of his friends and supporters were the driving force behind putting this uh, electric co-op together. And the original source of generation was hydropower because of the dams on the Colorado River. Uh, that Again, another uh, you know, New Deal program and a New Deal policy and the, the state of Texas was also involved in. So it's kind of interesting because in the last probably five years ago, the 75th anniversary for we had ours when I was board president, which was a great pleasure. But there were a lot of co-ops around the country celebrating their 75th anniversary because they all, to a large degree, came in during this era, uh, primarily late 1930s, early 1940s. And that's why today I think there's roughly 900 electric cooperatives around the country that was a good map to put up and you know we serve like 80 percent of the land mass in the united states you know obviously we don't have the most people for service area but it's an extremely you know large area and very diverse i mean and created in order to equitably serve communities that were otherwise unprofitable to put up lines and get uh, electricity. Yeah, and let's, and let's face it, the investor-owned utilities, uh, there was no return on investment. There was no way that they were going to go out and serve, you know, your basic mom and pop, you know, small farm or, or in our case, uh, ranch, um, where there was not really going to be significant revenue, especially in the 1930s. Right. Fast forward to this day and age. Uh, I was surprised to learn early on after early conversations with you that the Rural Electrical Cooperative Association isn't necessarily uh, favorable to distributed renewable energy production by its farmers and other members who would naturally want to put up 
uh, distributed renewable energy generation. Uh, could you talk a little bit about why that is the case? Yeah, and that's, you know, I love irony. <laughs> and it's, uh, it is quite ironic that a lot of the electric co-ops around the country, like I said, we started with hydro and uh, have uh, subsequent to that, and that's not everybody, of course, but uh, there were a lot of co-ops, for example, in the South that were part of the TBA, you know, again, big hydro projects. But, you know, coal generated electricity became, you know, a significant part of uh, the supply in, in many areas of the country. But let me, again, fast forward, because this is some of the, the friction that's going on right now, because, uh, and let me use wind, for example. Texas is now the number one wind energy producer in the nation. Of course, California is second. But wind production, not just here, but especially up through the Midwest and, and further north, wind power has become extremely significant and has become a larger part of the portfolio. Uh, solar is, is gradually moving, but it's really coming from two different directions. You know, wind is, you know, it's kind of the mega supplier because, you know, we're having large major wind farms with, you know, big contracts and big financing. You know, solar, on the other hand, as everybody knows, is uh, there's more demand of it down at, the, you know, the consumer and the retail level. Although, of course, many businesses are now interested in that too. We can talk about that later. You know, one of the things... The, the folks at the Rural Electrical uh, Cooperative Association said when I met with them in, in D.C. was that, uh, that they, yeah, they are intending to roll off the dependence on, on fossil fuels, their generation, their, but they, right. they're invest, but that, that curve of that decarbonization relates directly to the debt that they hold in, in, um, in uh, fossil fuel generation plants. Right. And so they're reluctant to uh, to create a bunch more supply that's cheap that's cheaper for the the way the the energy is sold on the market um, is is cheaper and um, so could you speak a little bit to that and maybe um, yeah. how the possibility of additional load from something like solutionary rail um, might uh, unburden or unstick that stuck aspect of their uh, policy. Right. You're exactly right. Because here's the conundrum and here's what, you know, a lot of us have been talking about and how, you know, we think leadership can change, you know. And yes, it's true. A lot of co-ops, especially a lot of, the, so we call them the GNTs, I'm using jargon, generation okay. and transmission cooperative. They are large cooperatives. They're basically big co-ops form GNTs you know, out of, you know, 20 to 30, there's a lot of them out West. So yes, it's true. They are engaged in a number you know, uh, of these, you know, long-term contracts, but that's generally used as the excuse of why we've got to keep all these states going. There are a lot of things and we did a lot of this. Okay. There's renegotiation of contracts, which everybody, you know, can do. Uh, the truth of the matter is natural gas prices are driving the the market right now, uh, not just natural gas. I mean, it, it's also influencing wind, solar to some degree, but uh, but gas prices are, are very significant, especially, of course, and more so in our part of the country. But there are a lot of other factors, and you also have the situation where it's all these co-ops say, we want new business, we want new members, we want to attract people. Uh, and, and create new jobs. Well, the truth of the matter is, and if any, any of you saw uh, the New York Times this morning, the stories that came out, of the Fortune 500 companies in the United States, half of them now have a business plan that is dedicated toward having a uh, reduction of a carbon imprint to influencing and trying to have an impact on carbon change and climate change, and also to specifically move into renewable sources of energy. Okay, quick example. When I was board president, 
We were negotiating with a 500, Fortune 500 company. The reason they, they came in to look at where we were in Central Texas, they wanted 100% renewable power. It's part of their business plan. They wanted it by this year, 2017. We said, okay, we can do it. You know, we had, basically, we had wind contracts. Uh, we've got some hydro, a tiny bit. There's some, but between our wind contracts and with, with solar, it, it was fine. All the I didn't figure this out. The smart people did. Yeah, yeah right. the that's what I say about solutionary rail. And this is what I've tried to talk to all these directors about. If you, you're looking at, at coal and your production and everything, and it's like looking at business back in the 20th century, okay? You're not putting yourself in the position of where the marketplace is today, what consumers are doing. And I don't care if you're living in a little bit town like I live. I live in Wimberley, Texas, you know, population. It's a couple thousand people, you know. Um, but, of course, you know, we're right next to the, the great, you know, music capital of the world, Austin, Texas. Lucky you. I wait for the New Orleans. Okay. Yeah, right, right. right. Alan, sure. right. The, the point is, you've got to really look and see if you're really going to be sincere about wanting to change your business model. You know, you've got to not just look at your supply side, you've got to look at your demand side. You know, again, I'm an historian, but I study economic and business history too. And you see how things change. And this is what I'm telling all my brothers and sisters this that are in the co-op world and are directors too. I said, folks, you know, you may not like the way things we've done things at PEC. That didn't hurt my feelings. All I'm saying is, you know, you've got to really look at what's going on in the marketplace. You know, what businesses are saying. You know, I, I quoted Fortune 500. I, we got little bitty small, you know, single owner, family owner businesses here that want to do the same thing. They're interested in renewable power as well. It's good for their business and they know it. Right. Well, um, would anybody like to uh, raise your hand and uh, get a get a question in? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, Alan. Uh, Alan Drake is one of the technical team for the Solutionary Rail Project. He ha has a vast knowledge of the subject and rail electrification in general and has been a real innovative voice in this. Uh, I have long ties uh, before I moved to a, a city with better music in Austin. I did a study with LCRA when I was in school on right. using ink and Botanin as a pump storage duo. And um, I have had a tour of Fayette uh, Power Plant, which is coal and half R LCRA, right. half R and en energy. And I know Roger Duncan fairly well. Um, oh, good. Okay. By the way, Roger is one of the environmental heroes of the utility industry going back decades, and uh, especially on energy efficiency. Right. I tried and failed on a, a project because we were just too late to use electrified rail instead of a, a pipeline to pump water from uh, the that San Antonio bought up uh, mm -hmm. in the, uh, you, you know the one I'm talking about, the $2 yes. billion dollar pipeline. Yep. Yep. And it would have been better to have done that on an electrified rail line and we had, and they agreed that it was not a bad idea and they wanted to look into it further but it was just too long down the road to have done that. And I think the basic concept of moving water by rail, which means that it's a deferrable movement. Mm -hmm. there's, there's rarely any time pressure. And San Antonio, they would have, if we'd gotten there two years earlier, we, we might have made the deal. But we were just didn't hear about it soon enough and we're too late. So right. uh, in, any future water movement and I could give you all sorts of reasons why electrified rail would be better including lower capital cost mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested in in hearing about that and right. also uh, just generally looking for deferrable load in many areas that's a real important point about because and it's not just in Texas but throughout the West and a lot of areas of the country right now you know, water as in scarcity, uh, you know, pollution, and, you know, our need in for uh, water, both for residential and commercial use. 
it is a huge issue. And it's a great partnership to just the little bit I heard there. It's a great partnership because as we have tried to move forward in the energy and the climate change uh, world uh, and build our coalitions, you know, the people that are interested in water and water conservation, because when you think about it, there's a lot of different organizations that cuts across all kinds of political worlds in that realm dealing uh, from it's not just yeah i know we have a member of sierra club it's just not just sierra club but y'all know this it's other sports organizations it's hunting and fishing groups you know it's all it's cities people that are interested and concerned with their you know their water and its availability and what we're going to be able to use and you know it, it, it's a it's a huge issue. It's a big soapbox for me, so I'll stop there. All right. Uh, thank you. Is, would anybody else like to ask a question of Dr. Cox? Yeah, yeah I was just going to ask about, I know this is a very complex issue and it depends on the particular co-op, but are rural co-ops looking for large industrial scale loads like electrified rail? Because I know I've seen co-ops whose peak load is less right. than 25 megawatts and that's like a, a full scale long haul freight train that's about the amount of electricity you'd need mm -hmm. right right yeah i think truthfully i think some are i think some of them maybe their general managers or the ceos have brought that up you know as a, as a possibility but i think this is a realistic you know, viable option. This is what I'm talking about. You know, there's got to be new avenues. And this is what I think, you know, one of the things Solutionary Rail offers. That for people, everybody talks about wanting, you know, to create new economies, new jobs, you know, blah, blah, blah. Y'all know all that. And, you know, it's, but it's the people that are going to actually sit down and make the initiative to come forward and say, you know, this looks realistic. How, and it's a whole new area that we can get into. How can we make this work? Although, truthfully, if y'all read the little solutionary rail book, which is really good, in the history, you know, you go back 100 years, and they started with electric power as their energy for, uh, for a lot of the rails. So it's just got to help us. I mean, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the light will pardon the pun, but hopefully the light will come on, you know, with some of these folks, and they'll, they'll understand you know, that this really can be uh, a real break. I, again, I'm an historian, and when we study history, what you look for, what we call the points of departure, you know, these kind of little, you know, aha moments where people can actually, you start seeing the flow of history change. So, you know, this is potential, you know, water is one of those, I think, you know, like the rail issue, uh, electric, you know, electricity reformation, that's, that's all part of what could be a very important equation. What about Washington State? Uh, uh, we're number 33 in solar out of 50 states. You know, it seems like we don't have the competition. It's kind of a protectionist system here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how does Washington State tie into solutionary rail in the grid? You mean in terms of electric co-ops? Yeah, what, what can we do in Washington State to be part of this? If you look at the map, yeah. you know, there's not much in the way of co-ops in Washington State. And right. Of course, California doesn't have much either. But there might be something instructive about the fact that, um, that, that Eastern Washington, a place where okay. we wouldn't necessarily right. assume to have a lot of allies, but I think that there's something very transpartisan about uh, okay. rail that that is compelling, may, may be compelling, and that, uh, that maybe one of the bridges to those communities is through conversations with the uh, electrical cooperative associations. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm in Thurston County, and we got the highest electric rates of anybody, and uh, we'd like to uh, become a, a P public utility district like Tacoma, but, uh, and they tried that in 2012, mm -hmm. but... It, uh, the PSE shot it down and they spent a million dollars defeating it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think yeah. we should probably do an entire other program. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. It's in regards to uh, the business model of, of, of how uh, any utility uh, makes its money or pays for its grid. Um, okay. Because that certainly is a big topic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. All right. Well, um, Patrick, um, do you have anything more that would uh, you'd like to close with there? One last comment about the solutionary rail, because when, uh, when you contacted me, and this is why I'm glad you put that map up, uh, because I thought, yeah, this is kind of a novel idea, you know, but how would co-ops be involved? But as soon as I saw the map, you know, between all the electric co-ops combined with the tribal lands, I think you figured it out, Bill, it's, it's roughly of the... 75% you know, the, of the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a massive amount of the project. So the point is, and I think y'all are approaching it the right way, you know, you got to have the good information, you got to make your case... But I, I really sincerely think because, you know, times have changed so much in the last 10 years and there's a lot of new people coming on these boards, finally, on electric co-ops. Uh, you know, I think, that, I think the time's right. I, I think the times, you know, people will understand that. And, um, you know, it's, it really is, it's, you know, for all the reasons that we lay out in this, you know, it really is a very very sound, real alternative uh, for what I would advocate for the co-ops in that area. Thank you again, Patrick. Uh, we okay. are going to transition to some report backs from some of the good work that's been done in the last couple of weeks. Okay. I just right. want to say thank you again to you and for um, the leadership yeah. you provided uh, both at your uh, co-op and, and in, then in this campaign. And the, the idea that, you know, continuing to be in touch and to work together to uh, champion a different model, maybe we can be that uh, pivot point. So, um, right. and I know everybody's working on a lot of different pro projects and great programs, and it's all going to help move us all in the, the right di direction for a cleaner energy future and a, a better future for all of us and our, our kids. So, thanks to everybody. I appreciate the work everybody's doing. Awesome. Uh, hope to meet everybody at some point. I yeah, Washington, Bill. We were. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we have been talking about a fall uh, symposium or, or a stakeholder yeah. meetings. So, okay, right, lovely. Anybody but, comes to Austin, let me know. Hope oh, a winter vacation in Austin. All right, take All right. it easy. Okay. Peace. Bye -bye. Peace.